Hello, everybody. Well, my name is Four Arrows. My uh, uh, Anglo name, my Irish name is Don Jacobs. And uh, I'd like to open with a, a Lakota prayer. And so if everyone would just tune in in your own meditative way so that you can feel the vibrations of this Lakota prayer, and then I'll, I'm going to actually talk about what it meant. Wakantanka to Gashila Unshi Ahituayan Kelo Oyate Oyasi Unchi which other pona Oichakipo, at your which was only washed when you were big tail. Oyate Oyasi Chanko Ruto, my mammy Oichakipo. The chill what she or Hesher now Oyate Kimi Pite. The Haila Kovich of Haki to Gashila Kishuye Metakoyasa. In that, in that prayer, I'm, which is a typical mission for opening an important meeting, I refer to Wakantanka, which is interpreted as the great mysterious thing. Uh, this would be the term that in, in uh, the, the dominant worldview would be referred to as, as God. But in, in indigenous ways, um, it's a great mysterious thing, energy, uh, mother, father, energy. Uh, it's too unfathomable to really speak directly to, except briefly. And immediately then I went into Unchi and Tunkashila, which is grandmother and grandfather. And these are terms of endearment that refer to the expression of this amazing creative energy uh, in the frogs and the trees to be humble, modest, unpretentious, uh, to persist, to strive in spite of difficulties, to hold uh, others in high esteem, to have integrity, be honest, to hold one's head, uh, to place and hold one in, uh, one in one's heart and mind, to give oneself uh, to to recognize what is real, um, to care, sympathize, to show courage and fearlessness, um, and to understand uh, and, and use knowledge wisely. So you can see in, in this prayer, and then it ends with an acknowledgement uh, that, um, uh, that we, are, we are all related that everything is, is, is connected and that the animals understand and remember the original ways. So I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever uh, explained the prayer before. I've offered it for many, many, many years, but um, I thought that would be a good way for us to begin. And I, and I asked not to have a, uh, an introduction to, to laud my, you know, my accomplishments and my publications and all that because we're going to be talking a lot about trance-based learning and hierarchy and the phenomenon of, of uh, authoritarianism in our, in our dominant worldview in ways that show that, you know, um, we have to be careful about, about this phenomenon of, of hypnosis and how, you know, uh, the speaker's agencies rightfully say that if, you know, you're going to introduce a keynote or a speaker, you, um, you really, you know, tell all about uh, who they are so that they have a greater impact. Well, you know, I, I really want you all to, 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 to just have an impact based on what uh, we talk about today and what, and what the ideas are. And with that in mind, instead of doing a, a PowerPoint, I've uh, put together notes for everyone that I'm going to send to you if you email me so that you have them. And, uh, and what I'm really hoping to do in this session is have a dialogue to ask the questions that come up uh, and then talk about how to, to, to respond to them as relates to using our original nature-based worldview to, to be the foundation for education. And whether it be formal education 
or informal education uh, in any in any way, um, from family to to business to community, um, and so uh, with but before we 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 start this uh, and uh, and we go over these notes uh, briefly, I'll go over them so that I can give you enough information to be able to ask the questions. Uh, I want to just show you a two minute, 30 second uh, video that I created to give a, an essence of what I am referring to when I talk about indigenous worldview. So here it is. The earth is suffering. Climate change, pollution, and pandemics are some of the consequences of human-created assaults on our world. According to the United Nations Biodiversity Report, one million more species face imminent extinction, including us. We must live on Earth differently, if not for ourselves, for future generations. 80% of global biodiversity now exists on only 20% of the Earth. It is no coincidence that this small amount of land is mostly managed by indigenous cultures. According to 450 multidisciplinary scientists, extinction rates have been less severe or avoided entirely in these areas held by indigenous people. We can all learn to live with greater respect for our non-human life forms. This is possible if we embrace the world that has guided us throughout our existence on this planet. In contrast to the dominant world, the indigenous one truly emphasizes our relationship to the land, the environment, and all its interconnected inhabitants. Without remembering this oneness with all of life, we are doomed. Regional and global scenarios currently lack explicit considerations of the indigenous worldview. It is also important that we do our best to protect and support the remaining indigenous cultures. They are fighting against all odds to protect the last of Earth's biodiversity. And while doing this, we can all re-embrace the worldview indigenous peoples share. We can come to understand that human relationship with nature is a continuous two-way dialogue. That natural resources are better thought of as relatives and teachers. Gratitude is essential. The universe is constantly in flux. Time is circular. Respect for diversity, equality, and justice is crucial. Spirit is in all things. And that human knowledge must be joined by a fearless trust in the unknowable mysteries of nature. Let us remember who we really are and reestablish our intended way of being with respect, generosity, gratitude, and of course, the happiness that comes from this. Matakwe Oyasi, we are all related. Okay, so that was a uh, little presentation that I did uh, as a Fulbright Scholar for Papua New Guinea uh, project that we were doing, uh, but it, it, it turned out that uh, UNESCO used it to close their sustainability conference this, this year. So that's a kind of a snapshot of what we're talking about with Worldview. And I'm gonna run really rapidly through some of the aspects of how to implement uh, the indigenous worldview uh, and what that means. Uh, and then I, I hope that there, this will stimulate questions so that we can really get into dialogue about uh, how you can use this in, in your work. So briefly, I'll go through this and you can read it with me as we go through it. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger if I can. All right, so obviously it's a Euro European word that started this concept of worldview, Weltanschauung, and it uh, you know was intended to denote an image in which somebody blends the multi. This is a direct quote from a uh, encyclopedia. 
It blends the multiplicity of beings, values, duties, particularly through the concept of beginning that explains the existence of the universe, the concept of supreme value to which the universe tends to its end in which it derives its meaning. Kind of a complicated sentence, but you know, worldview is, we, I have looked for many decades uh, for a better word to describe indigenous worldview because it's, uh, uh, it, we, we are in the world, not seeing the world. But the concept has emerged to be something that is very, very important. Um, as inadequate as the word itself may be. For most of the history of worldview, it's been a battle between secular science and religion. In fact, if you go online and put in uh, uh, worldview books, 90% of them will be books uh, of religion. Most of those will be, be Christian religion books. Um, and so, you know, when science came, science was sort of the worldview that overtook religious ideologies. Uh, but there's the pushback is over the last, you know, 50 years has, has been that religion is bringing it back. Well, Robert Redfield was considered to be the father of social anthropology out of the University of Chicago. Uh, he really brought the concept of worldview uh, to a more academic place. And in essence, he said there's only two worldviews. Uh, and one is what is the dominant worldview. He said, it, it, originally, he said there were three. There was the Eastern, the Western, and the Primitive, the, the, which was how we referred to indigenous. But he said that the Eastern essentially had uh, been overtaken by the Western. So by the time he died in the late 50s, uh, he was and his team from University of Chicago were saying, in essence, there's really only two essential worldviews. All cultures, religions, ideologies, and beliefs tend to fall under one of those. And we'll be looking at the worldview precepts uh, shortly. But for example, uh, if we look at the mainstream ideas of, of worldview, we understand that. Um, like an anthropocentrism, human centeredness undergirds most of Western uh, based uh, religions, political systems, education, etc. Whereas it, it, the great diversity of different indigenous cultures, that's a common theme. All right, so, um, and Redfield be believed that the greatest human tragedy ever was the overtaking of our original worldview, which in some, one of my books, Point of Departure, I contend that it happened around 9,000 9, years ago. So we've been dealing with a separation from nature for that for that long, essentially. Um, the uh, uh, the continual attack on indigenous worldview uh, and indigenous people, of course, is uh, is something that uh, continues today. And uh, in her in his uh, dissertation, uh, the origin of war. He says that the the, the um, societies that are been proven to be uh, relatively peaceful and sustainable, indigenous cultures, um, uh, that they they create a, a nuisance to most theories of warfare, and uh, um, and are explained away or, and, and are di dismissed. And in fact, uh, in my book on learning the language of conquest, I expose a lot of scholars that from Harvard and Oxford and other places who have written things like uh, you see uh, in six societies uh, or in war book for civilization, proposing that civilization and centralized governments have overcome the horrors of indigeneity, right? And so this is continuing all over, all over the world, of course, in spite of the the evidence that is is now uh, emerging. Um, a lot of, not a lot, but a few people had understood this uh, long ago. And I, I have a quote in here by the astronaut, the seventh man to walk on the moon, who founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, who said only a handful of visionaries recognize that indigenous worldview can bring us to a, a sustainable world. But the growing evidence today is, uh, is coming out that shows uh, evidence like this. For example, 
example, recent study of 13,000 years in the Amazon rain basin that that there were cities uh, comparable to any of that were that were in Europe, uh, and humans had a tremendous impact on the on the the Amazon rainforest. However, there were not extinctions. Uh, there, there was, there was uh, uh, the the understanding of interconnectedness and and balance that other animals uh, also uh, use for symbiosis. And so, uh, you know, the recent book, The New Dawn of Everything, showed that even the the European Enlightenment that talked about women's rights and democracy came from rumors of first contact with indigenous peoples. And of course, no one would, was about to give the credit because the papal bulls and the doctrine of discovery were all about taking over uh, the, uh, these people uh, and their and their lands. But the the information is 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 really coming out that uh, about these kinds of things. The largest study ever done, which you all saw, I'm sure, on the front page of your newspaper in May of 2019 was the biodiversity report of the United Nations. Uh, probably it didn't last on for more than a, a day because uh, it was a frightening headline that one million more species will become extinct in the next generation. Um, but in it, seven times they say and specifically refer to worldview, indigenous worldview, saying that where the indigenous worldview exists, the extinction uh, rates are severely reduced or non-existent. You can uh, go online and read my article about this in the, uh, in the nation uh, called uh, What the Media Missed, um, because it wasn't talked about, of course. So, um, you know, there is this decolonization of education movement that is happening in the world, uh, and it's trying to expose the colonized and the settler colonial problems of, of education. Uh, and it's, you know, it's starting to catch on in Canada and, and the United States and elsewhere. But, uh, and it's important, it's important to, to, to know the histories and, and the current uh, colonial problems. But what I want to talk about is what was lost, and that's not done often enough. Uh, we talk about the genocide, we talk about the inequality, we talk about uh, uh, all of the, the problems, but what's really important, I think, is what was lost, what was pre-colonial, and that's what indigenous worldview is about. So that's my really brief flowing introduction, and we're going to get the worldview chart out here and just show you what I'm talking about. Uh, because we're going to talk a lot about this uh, today. Um, but I want to say that, you know, that, and, and, I, and I'm going to send, if you, you, you guys, gals, uh, email me, I'll send you this chart and I'll send you the notes that, that, that I just uh, read from. Uh, but it's not intended to be a rigid binary, uh, but, a, you know, a true dichotomy. Now, it, it, one of the precepts of indigenous worldview is that it's a non-binary worldview. And yet here we have, I've, you know, I've put together a binary of comparing and contrasting the dominant uh, worldview manifestations with the indigenous ones. So we're creating a binary because there are opposites, right, in the world. There's dark and light and in and out, etc. However, we want to look at these not in the way that worldview has historically be do been done with the battle between religions and secular science, for example. Those were designed to stop dialogue. The worldview reflection of these uh, 40 precepts that I'm going to show you are um, really intended to encourage dialogue and respect for the continuum. Because as we look at these, we'll note that um, we can see the advantages, uh, especially this very special group, uh, of, 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 the, of the worldview manifestations of indigenous uh, cultures um, that were based on observing nature. 
and certainly nature understands uh, what it is to be in balance better than any particular human being, uh, culture or ideology. Um, but we want to look at all of us being on the left side of this chart in many ways. Um, and many people that are in the Western culture being on the right start in, in, in many ways. So in other words, it's a continuum. And uh, we've got to understand through the dialogue, what is it in this particular system or with this problem that is related to one of the things on the left? And how might it be improved or brought back into balance with one of the precepts on the right. So I'm just going to kind of go scroll down through this slow, slowly. And uh, I'm going to ask, you know, I think uh, we'll break, break into some breakout groups for you to look and say, well, where am I? You know, even with ecoversities and with my, uh, my inclination towards indigenous values, uh, where and how am I still operating or accepting or supporting some of these concepts that have been in mainstream education and that are in the mainstream media and that are in the mainstream political arena, et cetera, right? And, and in what ways can I better move over to the right side of this chart? And what ways can I do this? And we're going to talk about uh, what Michael Fisher uh, in his in his uh, his book on my work fearless engagement uh, of four arrows to, is called the cat fawn connection. He calls that a dehypnotizing technology. So we're going to come back to this uh, to this to this chart. Um, but in uh, in sort of that was part one, right? And we're, we're we're ten minutes into it, and that's that was part one. Part two is. Um, uh, that uh, I want to give you a sense of how the indigenous worldview is really a nature-based worldview by by offering the, these quotes uh, that I did in a recent uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, with three soil conservation uh, experts. And... Uh, when it was over, when we, after after the three people presented, when they were when they were finished with their presentation, it was my turn to present. And jokingly and, and winking, with good humor, I, uh, I I said to them, I said, you know, they said some very important things, all that were true about the importance of taking care of our of our soil. I said, however, it's not going to do any good. And of course, the audience kind of, you know, there's about 100 people in the audience say, oh, like, whoa, well, you know, what is he, what is he being so insulting to the, this, these presentation? And I said, well, look, they, their, their information was beautiful and, and important, just like it was of these three famous people, Franklin Roosevelt, Mahatma Gandhi, and Wendell Berry, the, the great uh, environmental, uh, environmentalist. I said, they said similar things as to what the panel said, that a nation just that destroys its soil destroys itself. Um, Gandhi, to forget how to dig the earth and tend the soil is to forget ourselves. Without proper care of the soil, we can have no life. I said, those are important statements, but again, that is comes from a, a world view, one one worldview that isn't the one that's going to get us back into balance. And then I read this one. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Even the rocks thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people and the very dust upon which we stand responds lovingly to our footsteps. So let me call on somebody. So Fiona, can I call on you? Can you see, can you see a difference between the three uh, by Franklin Roosevelt, Gandhi, and Barry, and the one uh, by the indigenous, uh, the indigenous person? Did you call on Fiona? Yes. Hi, I just arrived. I Hi, arrived just in, I just arrived in time. Yeah, I was, well, first of all, I'm thinking of a quote by Pope Francis, who said that environmental 
degradation is a reflection of the degradation of humanity. <laughs> but I think the difference I see here is that one is the earth is the giving thing. It is the earth that will care for us. And the second one, I can't read, is that Chief Seattle? Yes. Or Chief, because Chief Seattle also said some powerful things about the earth as the mother and the giver. And uh, the other one seemed to be that we'll, we need to protect it. Beautifully it's said. a little bit of a counter narrative. Exactly. Anybody else? And that's, that's great. Anybody else see anything? Just jump in if you if there's something that, that you see as a difference. The the yeah, first sure. oh. well the oh, first three thank you. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um so first of all, thank you for the presentation. And what I noticed most specifically about this is that in the first three, perhaps you were about to say the same thing, Tom. But uh in the first three, the pronouns are always it. There is an inanimacy to the whole conception of our relationship with the rest of the living world. And Chief Seattle speaks of a living being and a relationship. Yes, and Tom, and Tom is, is, is nodding to that. And as you'll notice in, in, the, in, the, in the worldview chart, we'll see that, um, the, uh, that one of the thing is uh, seeing earth See if I can find it. Right here, number seven. Is that that's just what you were said, Aikido? Number seven says Earth as an unloving it, versus Earth and all systems as living and loving. So, so uh, that that that's a ref one another reflection. Anybody else have anything that they that they see in in, in their I think that think, really, yeah, go ahead. Oh, along with that, something I'm noticing is the first set of quotes um, seems a bit human centric, like let's protect soil in so far as it will protect us rather than it says um, for word in the second quote, soil is sacred. Like let's protect soil for the sake of soil and, and for what soil is. Um, so that's a definite difference in thinking I see between the two. Absolutely, absolutely. And just what a difference it would make if we could begin to, to see the world, uh, to use the, the, the definition of worldview as, a, as seeing, or feel the world, or be in the world, to be more accurate, uh, if we could have this, this, this perspective. You know, there's, uh, you know, uh, an idea that uh, the opposite of inclusion, you know, in this diversity and inclusion movement uh, that we see in all the, all the colleges and, and schools. I, I wrote a book uh, that um, recently that actually challenges that. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the, the, the Red Road Chankuluta. Uh, linking diversity and inclusion initiatives to indigenous worldview, um, uh, because the you know the 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 programs don't work. You know the hiring of of chief diversity officers. We know that that they're just they're not effective, because of 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 the idea that the opposite of inclusion is uh, or of ex the opposite of exclusion is not inclusion. It's decolonization, right? But decolonization has not really looked at what what was lost and that's the worldview even the amazing film exterminate the beast which was uh, the four-part series on hbo uh, a must see to understand the the history of the attack on this worldview and the and the people who have held it and who are holding it and still being attacked today it it really didn't talk about what was lost and, and i think the, all the you know the, the the voices I just heard from you that that saw the differences uh, in these and and, that, and and I chose three very pe you know people that I respect you know Gandhi Roosevelt and and Barry uh, and, and even they are part of you know their words are part of that of that worldview that doesn't doesn't go as far as uh, as our original worldview and I and I, I just put there right after another prayer that uh, is, is often said 
uh, in many indigenous cultures really relates to you see how everything is about what we learn from the earth that the grasses are still you know uh, with the new light that the teaches quiet and that the, the rocks and the stones teach us from their their observation of the world and from their suffering of and their memory uh, that the um, you know, on and on and on. The ant uh, teaches us, the eagle teaches us, you know, and, and this idea of, of animals and non-human entities really being teachers uh, is, 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 is a crucial part of, of, of the uh, worldview that we um, have, have lost in terms of guiding us uh, in the, the direction of, of extinction, essentially. Um, now, some of the challenges that, that you will face if you begin to use this worldview, as my, my students do, they use it um, in every class, they use it. They'll, they'll, and they'll, they'll point out, well, can we look at this from the viewpoint of these interactive, uh, overlapping worldview precepts to see, you know, why we're, why what is happening right now in the Ukraine is, is, uh, you know, what, what can we, what can we look at? And this is an exercise we might want to play with it today in our short hour to, to look at what worldview precepts, if they were not operating as the dominant way, and we moved in, in this continuum more over to the, to our nature based way, our original worldview, what, what would be the outcomes that would have prevented, you know, this, this, or that could possibly uh, mitigate what's happening? Um, and my students do this, do this all the time. But one of the challenges that comes up from, uh, from, from really people on all sides of the, the political uh, conservative versus liberal or whatever is wow, wait a minute, I, I don't have the right, I'm not an indigenous person, I don't have the right to, to t teach about indigenous worldview. That comes up so often that I wrote a peer-reviewed article called The Indigenization Controversy, For Whom and By Whom, that was published by the University of British Columbia's uh, Critical Education Journal. And, and and in it, I, I say that that we would need to make a distinction between place-based knowledge, place-based indigenous knowledge, and indigenous worldview. I, who have Cherokee ancestor and I'm a made relative of the Oglala, I don't have the right to teach place-based knowledge because although I, I speak the language somewhat, I'm not fluent in it. I was not raised in either culture. Um, uh, I, I, did, I did not, although I, I lead, you know, as a sun dancer, I, I lead, I can lead, uh, you know, Anipi ceremonies. I don't know all of the ceremonies. Only someone who was brought up in a culture that, and has been taught the ceremonies and that speaks fluently and knows the language. That is that place-based language is vital, it's, and it's what we're losing, and it and it may be you know the most important aspect of of indigeneity, and and that can be misappropriated by 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 taking the ceremony without understanding or by you know so many other other ways it can be misappropriated, and we need to do everything we can to support and protect. That, that knowledge. However, worldview, indigenous worldview, in which all of these place-based knowledges are contained as an umbrella, those common features of the great diversity of indigenous cultures, that belongs to everybody who is indigenous to planet Earth. And, and I, I can quote Fool's Crow and White Standing Buffalo and Rick Two Dogs and some of the most respected of, of uh, indigenous peoples who say anyone that believes that, that, that we cannot share this medicine doesn't understand the medicine. And so I really can say to you that I know many non-indigenous people 
who have not who have who have a better understanding now of indigenous worldview than many of my indigenous brothers and sisters. I have 14 Navajo students from the, from the United States uh, Navajo Reservation. All of them are fluent speakers, and all of them are trying to bring back their culture by getting the white man's doctoral degree. But they will share that about 70% have been missionized, have, have, have forgotten the old ways. The languages are being lost. So we need allies. We need non-Indian allies, right? And so the last thing I want is somebody who's a strong believer in this stuff to say, oh, but, but I, don't, I don't feel comfortable doing this, right? I honor that they respect that so many things are misappropriated. And indeed, even among indigenous people, we're split. You know, half of my brothers and sisters say, I don't know why you're trying to bring this into education. Education is what screwed things up here for us, right? And, uh, and they're going to they're gonna not allow it. Just like my Sundance chief, he doesn't allow non-Indians to come into the Sundance. He allows them to come on, into other ceremonies just because the Spirit said, eh, they're likely to misappropriate that in some way, right? But not worldview. Worldview is what belongs to, to all of us. And, and most you know, of, of the people that I respect, uh, indigenous uh, elders, I guess I'm at 75, one of them now, believe deeply that we all need to be teaching, teaching this. Now, another complaint about my worldview chart, which was based on a lot of scholarship uh, that I could, I could, in other presentations I've gone through, um, is that, ah, it's a rigid binary. And rigid binaries are dominant worldview problematics. You're either with us or against us. It's good or bad, right? And, and it's, it's understandable how uh, someone could, could see that, especially if you live in a binary worldview, which we do. The dominant worldview is a binary worldview. It's kind of easy to do that because we're looking at two sides, right? Let's go back to the chart. We're looking at two sides, and I'm making a, essentially the, the point that it's better to be animistic and biocentric than anthropocentric, you know, it's better to see truth as multifaceted than as absolute. You know, it's better to resist authoritarianism than to, you know, it's an either or kind of a thing. It seems on the surface, but as I said at the beginning, and what and how it, I, I talk about it in the preface, that this has got to be seen as a true dichotomy, which is. A, a, a potential continuum in which we look at the potential for complementarity. Um, you know, and uh, I'll just take a, a brief diversion and talk about complementarity. If we look at the, at the balance of sun and moon, of the solar and lunar energies that are in each of us, we can see that in opposites, are these opportunities for finding complementarity. Uh, even, uh, you know, the, the idea of Darwin's evolution, you know, uh, the survival of the fittest. It was really, he, you know, he made the comment, uh, uh, as did the subsequent book called Mutual Aid, that, um, no, no, the, the earth, you know, this is one one part of, of, of what I want to talk about. He says, uh, you know, this idea of, uh, of, of uh, the survival of the fittest really, you know, was a, was a neo-Darwin uh, concept that, that emerged from it. But he says, really, it's all about uh, complementarity. And, and that's what we see in, in, in nature. Um, and so how do we look at that? Well, we look at uh, even our, our origin stories. Okay, so we've got Romulus and Ramus, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Hercules and Iphicles. And in all of these cases, you have twin heroes. There's twin hero mythologies all around the world. And the twin hero mythologies over the last seven, 8,000 years have been turned into a solar dominance. So the solar twin kills the lunar twin. Or 
in the case of Hercules and Iphicles, you know, Hercules didn't kill Iphicles, his twin brother, but hardly anybody knows about about it, right? And and it's always been the lunar twin that has been the kill, the, the one that is more reflective, more passive. Whereas in the indigenous origin stories, I'll give you an example from one of the Navajo, where the two come to the father. You have the solar twin is monster slayer. The lunar twin is child born of the water. Now, they're on their way to, to fight the monsters. Well, who are the monsters? The monsters are, are in all of us. They're the potential for greed, the potential for materialism, the potential for jealousy, right? So they come to the monster with the long arms. And I can't remember what he represented, but it must have, maybe it was greed. And the monster with the long arms is they can't get past him to, to get to the top of the mountain. So Monster Slayer says he's the solar twin. No problem. I'm a good bow and arrow. I got I can shoot. I'm a good archer. And he starts to pull back his, his bow and release an arrow when his twin brother, child born of the water, the lunar twin, says, Brother, please don't 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 do it. I don't think the arrow is gonna get to him in time before he can grab it and grab us. So Monster Slayer puts it away. Now, Hercules would have said, come on, you sissy, I, I, I'm Hercules, right? But he said, no, I'm going to put it away. What do you think we should do? And Child Born of the Water says, I think we should sing to him. So they sing to him and the monster lets them pass. So these have been maintained in the indigenous worldview, all right? So, so I kind of put in a quote from Dr. Hilary Webb, a dear friend of mine, who wrote a book on complementarity called Yanatin and Massentin in the Andean World, Complementary Dualism in Modern Peru. And it was her dissertation. And, uh, and she wrote this uh, blurb for our, my forthcoming book uh, from Pe Penguin Random House uh, and, and NAB. She says, um, uh, uh, where does she say this? A glorious prism of voices calling out to us to imagine a more inclusive and sustainable way of being. I ache for the kind of world that is invoked within these pages. In, in our book, we use 28 of the worldview precepts and have indigenous voices articulate them. And that's what she's referring to. So I kind of use this as evidence to my, my liberal colleagues in the university who say, oh, this is a binary chart. I'm not going to look at it, right? So that's another another barrier that you'll bump into, right? And then finally, uh, I want to talk about how do we look at this worldview, decide when we should be operating in this nature-based worldview in, 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 in context, you know, in, in, our, in what we're doing and when, how we might be violating it or out of balance with it or not complementary with it. Um, uh, how do we move from that cognitive orientation of this and that to actual implementation in our thinking and, and our actions? Uh, and I had a near-death experience uh, when I got out of, I was, a, I was a Marine Corps officer during the Vietnam War. And uh, when I got out of the Corps, uh, I had a big, chip on my shoulder, a lot of anger. And I took it out on uh, by doing whitewater adventures and uh, wild horse uh, training and this, these kinds of things. And um, I had a near-death experience. In fact, you can go on uh, YouTube and put in the shaman's message and see the journey in the Rio, into the Rio Uric River in, in, here in Mexico. Um, where uh, my I, I disappeared into an underground uh, hole in the middle of the river. Um, and I, I had come upon a, a mountain lion in a cave with my partner, David Carr, who was a fellow firefighter at the time. Uh, and uh, I also come upon the Rarumuri Indian people who had run down a deer until the deer's feet were bleeding and he carried it. And, and that, that fawn, that baby deer and the mountain lion, the cat, came after my near-death experience is a vision of letters, C-A-T and F-A-W-N. Um, and uh, uh, over a long period of time, uh, it came to me what that meant. And uh, 
Um, uh, I went back, I quit, I quit what I was doing as a sports psychologist and went back to university to get a degree in uh, curriculum and instruction focusing on indigenous worldview. So I want to talk about what uh, Michael Fisher, my bio biographer, calls uh, dehypnotizing technology to help us uh, with this. Uh, and CAT is essentially understanding the phenomenon of hypnosis and how it's the only way we can explain poisoning our air and poisoning our water, that we are hypnotized by the authority and the power of words because we don't understand it and others that are in control do. Um, and that we hypnotize ourselves with our, with our words uh, and uh, um, that uh, uh, we, that ceremony, indigenous people without knowing the neuroscience and the term hypnosis, they knew if they wanted to be more generous, they wanted to hunt better, they wanted to be more nurturing, whatever, willful determination alone was not sufficient. And so we had ceremonies for all occasions and for each thing. And ceremony essentially is a hypnotic phenomenon. You go into a lower brainwave frequency, you have intentionality, and you have imagination, which is what this conference is about, that is believed in deeply. And that was a, a way to keep our, our, our beliefs, our worldview operational until a couple of us must have screwed up 9,000 years ago and moved into a, a, a different hierarchy. Uh, and, and authoritarianism, which I, t I talk about in, in Point of Departure. So that's kind of what I want us to do today. And um, uh, uh, this I will send to anybody who you know, sends me an email, my email, um, djacobs at fielding.edu. I'll put that in the, in the chat box here. But um, uh, so these are just some concepts that relate to worldview and uh i'm gonna um let me just put my put that in before i forget here d jacobs at fielding.edu and okay so i'm trying to see how many people we got well there's only 26 of us i maybe instead of breaking into breakout rooms Maybe we can just do this as one as one group so we don't miss anything. But I'd like to open it up at this point in time before, because I could talk forever about about worldview and, and, and I got a hundred PowerPoints I could show, but I really want to see if we can get a, 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 a sharing going on. So based on what I've said so far about using the worldview chart, um, to, uh, and I'll put it back up in a second so you can look at it again, but using that worldview chart as a way to reimagine education, um, the barriers to it, the possibilities, the concerns, and the questions that you might have. So um, you can raise your hand or jump in, or I can just go down the list, whatever whatever you think is better. Tom. One thing I love about your presentation, which is all of it, <laughs> well, I love all of it, but it, it is bringing up that issue of, of what can be shared and to whom and by whom and who has the right to this knowledge. And, and there is that dichotomy of some people saying this can't be shared and you can't have, you shouldn't be accessing the knowledge of other peoples um, versus what, what you said. Um, I imagine a lot of people here have read Tyson Young Caporta's Sand Talk and heard him talk or speak. And he, well, he's complex. So there's a lot of things he has said about this. But he does say, encourage people to discover their own indigenous roots and practices and points out that every people group of people has those. And I think the challenge for a lot of us who are white people uh, or, or certainly not living in 
our genetic ancestral lands, you know, it's, it's difficult, it's a challenge. And so it's especially good, I think, the people who are sharing the knowledge that they can share, that that is there to share. As I put in the chat, um, uh, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center here in Albuquerque is one a wonderful example and someone posted another one of where there is the sharing going on appropriately <laughs> and with, with containers and boundaries. And I just think that's so important. It really is. It really is. Thank you. I'll share my screen again real quickly. And this is uh, this. The, you can see Tyson Yucaporta uh, from uh, Sand Talk um, is he's uh, he he gave uh, you know endorsement for for the for for uh, the book that I have coming out with Darsha Narvaez, um, and uh, I, you know and, he, and it was, which is all about worldview, of course. And he writes, humans have a particular ecological niche, a role as the custodial species of the earth. We must return to this within the next decade. That's the urgency with which he has on this. Our parish. Noam Chomsky says the same thing, said the same thing on one of my, my previous books uh, on indigenizing uh, education. Um, uh, he said, we listen to this or we are doomed. Um, and so uh, um, I think that that's important. The, um, the article, uh, I'll show you that it's easy to access that, is, that, that, I, that I referred to that topic. Uh, let's see, I just go, just put in um, the indigenization controversy, and it should come right up. I'll put in for whom. Yeah, and there it is. Okay, so it's all it's online right there, and uh, um, and 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 you can read it. And interestingly, the thing that caused me to write that article, aside from you know having a lot of people over the years be concerned, like yourself, you know, good-hearted people. Well, I don't want to. I know there's been so much misappropriation. I don't want to add to that. Um, I had uh, the producer of Indian Horse, uh, an amazing film that was produced out of Canada, uh, based on a, a book by that about the boarding schools and a sock in a uh, hockey player. And the uh, the producer uh, director, I think Clint Eastwood was was a co-producer, um, and uh, uh, and uh, Christina Hablo was the director. She contacted me because a group of indigenous women had written her a very nasty letter when the author of the book that the movie was based on died and she had continued the movie. Now, Christina was, uh, and I, you know, I, I was just getting to know who she was when she contacted me, but um, on set, they, they did prayers before each set, each scene. They had all indigenous people played the roles. So, I mean, she was really, she, as a white, a white director, she was doing everything to really honor the continuation of, of his work. And, uh, and yet a group of indigenous, you know, uh, women felt that who were on that other, other end of the spectrum wrote a very nasty letter. And so that prompted me to, to write this article in Canada, because that's where it happened. And, and that group has really, has backed, backed down from it, kind of apologized for it. And, yeah. But this is how, how I said, we're divided, right? We're just, we're just divided by this. But it, it's understandable, because if, if, you're, if you're an indigenous person, and you're holding on to the anger, then that anger has that component. It has that component of separation. And, 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 and I don't think that's healthy, right? Even though you have to understand it and have empathy for it, right? Okay, so what else? That's one point. Anybody else have a, about how to implement? Yes. I mean, it has... Yeah, hi there. It was so fantastic to hear you share, Don. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this conflict and the resolution of conflict is 
often where we're at, like, you know, rich, large and kind of as above, so below. And, and it feels like, you know, even in the teams that I'm working on that, that there is a indiv some, somehow an individual conflict between people that's overshadowing the purpose of the group. So it's happening like said, at the broad level and in the small level. And in this context of taking advantage of indigenous kind of wisdom and values, how do you balance that kind of group, group priority versus the individual requirement? And how do you reconcile those challenges that, that we will all face? You know, a lot of people say that the indigenous worldview is a collectivist one and that the dominant one is an individualistic one. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You've never seen such a group of autonomous people until you've lived with the Rarumuri Simiron people, as I did, or the Kunkhak people, or, you know, people that are living in the traditional way. Boy, they're, they're independent cusses. So the individual piece is really strong, right? But the autonomy that they fight for and the freedom uh, from hierarchy that they, that they support is for the purpose of the collective, for the purpose of the greater good. And so, so that in a, in a worldview world where individuality is put forth in a different way, that it's almost for its own sake, that conflict is what that you're identifying brilliantly is is constant right whereas mm -hmm. if you get into a worldview where you go well wait a minute hey the uh, my my voice you know is so important my identity is so important my uniqueness is so important yes and i want to listen to how the greater good can be served by this argument or this problem right I think that your question is a, is a great one for looking at how worldview can can change that. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I think we're almost at the end of our hour. Oh my gosh! But the cat fawn connection, uh, if if you if you you know if you look at the idea that we just take four of the worldview precepts because all forty of them are so important, but if we just take four of them. Fear, authority, words, nature, fawn. And we look at whatever challenge we're having, like that situation. What's the fear that's involved here? And where did it come from? On whose authority? Something my dad said, something the Pope said, something a book, something that I had a trauma in, in early childhood that made me think. And what words are being used here and how accurate are they? And what am I saying to myself? And finally in, in what way have I not used nature's teachings and how can I? And when you cognitively look at the source of the fear that relates to the problem or the challenge, the source of the authority for what is guiding it, the words that are being chosen to be used which are powerful Word, words are like Kipling said, mankind's most powerful drug. Right. And I mean, I, I had, when I, when I, I taught hypnosis at UC Berkeley and, and I, I had a client call me one time that and I won't go into the details, but the bottom line was, I said, well, what do you say before you go into the meeting and causes you to sweat? Well, I don't know. I look at my watch and I said, I have to be on time. I said, well, before you come in to see me, I want you to do something. Just say it next time. I want to be on time instead of I must be on time. And he called me up and said, I haven't sweated in four meetings, right? So words are powerful. Words are powerful, right? And, and they need to be sacred and understood. It's one of the problems. Indigenous languages are verb-based and it's very difficult to concretize them. Whereas not so with our European languages, right? So we have to be very careful. So cat, fawn. Concentration activated transformation, which is self hypnosis, which everybody can learn to do so simply and easily. Uh, um, and, and then we really use it as a part of your daily, daily work. I've had three spontaneous remissions from terminal cancer, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, for, since 2008. When I, 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 I had to have three of them because I, I lost my balance three times, right? But I never do, did chemo and never did uh, 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 surgery. 
and uh, um, I self hypnosis was was a component of that in the in the lodge. I mean, ceremony was part of that too, right? So, um, well, wow, our time. I, if this is really only an hour, our time is up. I'm so sorry we didn't have more time for for dialogue. And I I I will send that that that. Uh, that those notes, any if you you know if you want to look at those, and if you, anybody has any other questions, so. Um, Don, I just had a clarifying question. You described uh, self hypnosis, you know, the cat aspect re, re, being self hypnosis, and when you say self hypnosis, is there a specific protocol, or I think that you have in your mind uh, vis a vis some form of trance, or is it the many techniques that have developed around the world around? Yeah, I mean, for this is this is what I have people people do who are just learning it. Ultimately, you just know it and you, you just go into it. Yeah. Uh, I, I interviewed a guy named Don Buck who uh, in Japan went into an arena and hit a bull with his fist and knocked it out. He could take a dime and bend it and bend it and then tear it in half, an American dime. Yeah. And I knew he was doing hypnosis of some sort because you know I was, I was, that was what my field was uh, as a sports psychologist. And, and so I interviewed him and he didn't know what hypnosis was and he just kind of went to it. But I learned from his storyline that he did it right. Uh, I was uh, in a hospital getting uh, my appendix taken out and I asked the anesthesiologist if I could use hypnosis as I was doing for my, some of my clients that were doing plastic surgery in San Francisco. And he said, yeah, I will let you do that. I was, I was surprised that he said, I was kind of hoping he wouldn't let me. But um, anyway, uh, it's a powerful modality. To learn it, if you just get a pendulum, and, and, I, and I think I said in, in, in notes to, to, to some people yesterday, uh, a piece of dental floss and a paper clip will work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you just hold your elbow on the table like this, and you imagine it going in a circle. Just imagine it and believe in that image. Now, if you try, yeah, do it right now. Just, just have that. All right, there you go. And uh, and do you have the elbow on the table or off the table? You have it on the table, so you're not you're not having any strain. And, and if you can have the the pendulum as, as as close to the table as you can, that's that, that or, or as long as you can. But that's fine. Just leave it like it is, so we all we can all see it. Yeah, have it a little bit, little bit longer. All right. Now make it get make it stop so it's completely still. Completely still. All right. Now. Now, just go ahead and move it in a circle, but regularly, just with your fingers. And everybody can see your hand moving. Okay, now stop it again. Okay. Now, look at it. Remember what it looked like when it was going in a circle. Just look at it, stare at it, and begin to make it move with a different part of your mind that's going to activate the idiomotor neurons in your fingertips. So imagine it going round and round, bigger, bigger, Bigger. I'm going to have you do it since you must have practiced this. I'm going to have you go in reverse now. Slow it down and reverse it. Just imagine it. Imagine it slowing down and stopping and then going in the opposite direction. Just imagine it. Look at it and see what's happening. And what he's using now, he's using another portion of his brain that is activating what's called idiomotor neurons in the fingertips, which are sufficient to make this go around, right? Now, why is that important? Now, you keep it going, keep it going in that circle. That All that's doing is telling you that if it's going, you're in a light trance state. If it stops, that means you're thinking about it or you're embarrassed or whatever, right? But if you can keep it going, that means you're in a trance state. Now you double task with the image that you really wanted to have to be able to do your presentation or to be uh, more courageous or to be more friendly to your friend or whatever. This is just saving you paying me $300 an hour. <laughs> All right. In other words, it's just letting you know, oh, okay. I'm in that place. But you, you, if, if you have to think about what it is that you now want to imagine, it'll stop and you're out of it, right? So you want to have predetermined what you're, what this is going to be about. All right. When I go to work tomorrow, I'm, I am going to be different in this way. 
and you have that written down with positive words. It can't be negative words because the words are powerful. So a golfer, if he says, I'm not going to hit the ball on the sand trap, where is it going to go? It's going to go in the sand trap, right? Yeah. So, but this, all this does, now hypnotherapists use it for different reasons because it's like a truth uh, the detector, right? And, and, and they use it for different reasons. But I'm telling people to use it as a way to know when you are in that transition into a lower brainwave frequency that because uh, that's the only time the idiomotor neurons will actually fire right and now once you get that going that's when you have your pre other determined and if you can keep it going the pendulum going while you're equally imagining yourself walking up to that dog that you've been afraid of right with courage then you watch what happens it's so powerful and indigenous people have known this for tens of thousands of years set ceremonies for so many things right and uh and and different kinds of ways of entering into trance trance-based healing uh you know is is famous in the literature uh mm -hmm. for from indigenous peoples right so i i think it's a missing link in worldview reflection uh and one that uh that if we combine the cognitive worldview analysis and look at this chart and look at our at that chart um uh, and and by the way you can just put in uh, wor uh, uh what what is it that you would put in you put in worldview chart in google and my chart will come up in one of the one of the top top three but put in, or put in worldview chart four arrows right and that worldview chart that i showed you will come up so everyone has access to it okay mm -hmm. And post it on the wall and, and whatever place you're doing, you know, make it part of the conversation of looking at the challenges of people's lives, looking at what it is that we need to do or we want to do to be, get back into balance um, and uh, and how we can do it. And then, you know, um, invite people to go into meditation and, and, and to what we can call self-hypnosis to uh to manifest it and i think that I, I think that uh it's our best shot now i, I i'll close with this uh i uh someone asked me just before the the pandemic uh if someone closed just before the pandemic uh do, do you think we can turn things around if people re-embrace the indigenous worldview and it just came out of me i said no i don't think we can and the next question came up, well, why are you here? You know, why are you doing the work? And I said, because I want to be a human being. And that's why I just wrote the, the monograph on Sitting Bull's words for a time of crisis. Sitting Bull didn't have hope. Chicken pox, I mean, smallpox is wiping people out. The buffalo were all killed. But he never stopped laughing. He never stopped doing ceremony. He never stopped resisting. He never stopped helping. I think that the better definition of hope is not an outcome. It's a certainty that what you're doing is the right thing to do, regardless of the outcome. So I close with that, and uh, I, I offer a, a metakoliasin to everybody.